Hello, I'm Gibby Couple, and welcome to the Cubics tutorial. Cubics comes from a big underlying motivation. How can we win when building programming tools? If you're a researcher in this area or you, you follow the work that's being done in this area, you see it every year at every conference, there are many papers with many tools, many of which have used studies and they can take some tasks in software engineering and make it 10 times better, 10 times easier. So why can't I just go to the store and download many of these tools and run them in my software project? And to put some numbers to this, Latos and Myers in 2010 researched what question developers asked and found only a third of the time does a tool exist in some language Only a quarter of the time is a research tool, half the time there's no such tool anywhere, and then of course there are all the questions that the developers didn't think to ask. So the, the goal of this work is the belief that a major reason for this, not the only reason, but one that's totally solvable, is that the way tools are built today, they can each only built for one language. And so if we can find a way to overcome the heterogeneity of modern software engineering and build one tool for many languages, they can go from a world where none of these tools are economically worth building to one where all of them are. So enter Cubix. Here's what Cubix can do. I'm going to show you the sanitization uh, transformation, which is a transformation that you will build if you complete all four parts of the Cubic tutorial of the exercises. So I have here a directory of fairly random arbitrary code in several languages. It doesn't do anything. It's just there. I mean, the parts of language. The sanitization transformation is going to take every function call take and take the string parameter and wrap it in a sanitize function. So let's uh, run the Java version on this Java file. And uh, yep, it in fact sanitized the arguments to print on. Now let's try it for Python. Let's Dig up a Python file. Okay, so let's see. It's a perfectly fine Python file. And there it sanitized it's uh, for Python as well. And I'll note that it actually did something language specific here, where in order to get at this function call inside an elif condition, it actually had to split uh, that into a nested if else, which it was able to do uh, without any language specific code. So that, that is the power of Cubix, and this transformation works for all five languages currently supported by Cubix, which are C, Java, JavaScript, Lua, and Python. So today we're gonna to learn a bit about how this works. So it's a word of warning. So this, so Cubix is a Haskell framework. And so to go into the tutorial, you need to know some Haskell, especially GDTs. You know GDTs, you're probably good at the tutorial where you try to explain what everything else you need to know, but C Cubix is quite possibly the world's most generic, generic programming framework. You are parameterizing over an entire programming language. And so we use every feature of Haskell available as well as wanting some that don't exist yet. So you should really know Haskell. With expectations, C Cubix was built several years ago as a research prototype. We're currently in the process. We're working with an excellent consulting firm, uh, Byte Ally. You turn it into an industrial framework. So you will not be able to run Cubix out of the box today and get it to produce commercial tools. And we are so focused on 
solving many unsolved problems of programming tools that we didn't bother some to solve problems, such as preserving byte space. Um, but the good news is that these are all coming, and if uh, you want to use Cubix, we'll work very hard to add things for you. So a big problem for us, uh, that it has right now is uh, we only recently managed to compile with Dash 01. We needed a server with about 200 gigabytes of RAM. So let's begin. So Cubix is all is generally its framework is very good at doing generic programming for things in mobile languages. What it's really built for is transformation. It's how to write a single program that can turn a C program to a better C program, a Java into program to a better Java program, and so on for every other supported language. And when most tool developers see any kind of multi-language problem, they think, I know, I'll use an intermediate representation. So we're gonna talk about why this doesn't work. Here's a model. Let's pretend that language one is list of ints, language two is list of strings. And there are two conventional approaches to building an intermediate representation. First is the common, uh, the least common denominator approach, which I'll call the L of the M approach. Translate everything into least common denominator. So, you know, so in this case, um, language one has these fancy special integers that the other languages don't know about. So you turn them to strings, which is easier than the other way around. Uh, so. As an example of what can go wrong if you use a least common denominator AR, I'm going to show you an, an example of transformation. This is Sketch. It's a safe target because it was built by my lab. You don't need to know anything about what Sketch does. Other than that, for this example, it does not need to do anything. It could print the exact same thing as inputs. But in fact, there are no two lines in common between them. And the canonical thing that happens when you use a least common denominator intermediate representation is that all kinds of loop gets turned into Y loops. So the for loop has become a Y loop. The other approach to building intermediate representation is the union of AST's approach, which I'll, funny enough, like to call the Clang approach. So in this case, it's, uh, language one has ints, language two has strings. So get a list of either in string. If it can represent programs in any language, Unfortunately, it can also represent lists that have ints and strings, which are not valid in either language. And you tend to, you tend to confuse languages when you do this. And also, you're kind of not really writing multiple language anymore. So I call this the Clang approach. So here it is in Clang. It has both string literal and nodes and objective C, and objective C string literal nodes. I didn't know, and still don't know, that these strings were different, but apparently they are enough that you can't write a single operation that runs on both. And what I really am shocked to hear there could be any kind of difference is that apparently C++ and Objective-C have different kinds of bool literals. And so they have different bool literal nodes. So if you try to write a source source transformation on this AST, it will not be very multi language at, at all. But you all know a way where you can write a single function that works on both lang1 and lang2, and that is with parametric polymorphism. You make the inside into a parameter, and so you can do things. So we add some constraints and, and now you can sort it. And furthermore, if your compiler has uh, some good inlining, then the sort function will be just as efficient as any type-specific sort function that you would write. So in Cubix, our constraints are a bit more complicated than just has comparison operator, has an ordering. Uh, here's an actual example. This is the one from the tutorial, which means it's on this well, this is the hardest of the tutorial exercises, but it's on the simpler side of the Cubix transformation. 
you basically have to write down everything you know about a language, you know, everything that you need to know about a language in order for this transformation to work. But the upside is that once you do this, you get it working for many languages and you can compile an error when you try to run it on a language that does not have these features. So in this case, it's a mixture of some general tree traversal things on, and the presence of certain nodes. Other transformations will also have room for language specific code. See, so you can use arbitrary amounts of language specific code when writing QB's transformations if you need to. So let's talk about the newfangled fancy representation of Cubics that makes it able to do this. So let's go back to the basics and think from the ground up about how conventional ASTs are defined. Algebraic data types. Conventional abstract syntax trees, conventional language definitions are defined as, as algebraic data types. And algebraic data types we think of as being constructed in three phases. First, you have products, we give you actual constructors. A while node has is a product, it's a tuple, has two things, condition and body. You then sum many alternatives. So you have a while node or an if node, but I still haven't told you what the children are. And then finally, you take a fixed point and get recursion. So what are the possible children or the possible bodies of a, of a C statement, of a while or an if expression statement? Well, it's another C statement. And it's actually the last phase, the recursion, that makes it very hard to write modular, language modular code on top of these data types because um, the structure of a, a function on a data type follows the structure of the data type. And you see arrows going from, you see arrows going in circles on this, which means everything is known and everything else. You cannot write a function that just works in Y loops and doesn't touch or care about all kinds of C expressions and all kinds of C statements. So instead we defer the recursion step as long as possible. And this is a pretty common technique in advanced generic programming. So instead of working on these full recursive terms, we work on signatures. So the signature is just a list of possible nodes in language, and these can be summed and concatenated together. Everything's happy and modular up until you have to say where the children are. And then of course you do when you say, what these are my expressions, what are the children, there are other things in this list, and you get back to terms. So let's see how this works. This is a very famous paper um, from the previous decade by Wouter Sriestra. Uh, and a lot of people, myself included, find this kind of hard to wrap your head around the first time. Uh, and it's, it's all about putting a tight variable whatever your recursive spots and then but really you should just think of this data type here as being a, a Haskell representation of the idea of a signature. It's just a list of nodes, just just the nodes, you don't know who the children are, and you'll say later what the children can be when once you have the entire list of nodes. So these are nice and modular and they can be summed together and then fixed pointed. And so we just try to program as much as possible before we get to the fixed point part. This is extended in later work. Um, so I want to have a type variable for the possible children, the different sorts of children. Um, there are expressions and statements and um, translation units and imports and all kinds of stuff. So this type variable now becomes an actual family of type variables. So T sub expert is the type of expressions. What are the type of expressions? I haven't told you yet. I'll tell you later when I tell you what T is. T sub statement is the type of statements. And T is actually a type family. It's a function from sorts to terms of that sort. So, 
we directly builds off um, the Spar and HitVid the 2011 encoding in Cubix. So this is what terms look like in Cubix. So if you want a C statement for writing the language to the code, you say a term of signature C sig, that's the list of possible nodes in C of sort statement. But you add some variables and it gets more generic. So I have a concrete sort, a sign L. I turn the signature into parameter. Now I have assignments in any language. And go the other way. Term m java sig l. This is Java terms of any sort. I start to add constraints. Terms f's ident l in the language where assign is a subsort of f's typo on this slide. That is identifiers in any language with assignments. And this baby here, well, I've added a bunch of things. It's identifiers in any language which has a call analysis. And this thing here is a sort injection we'll talk about in great detail later. It means where identifiers may be used as normal function arguments. And you can already start to imagine how this kind of thing might be useful in many transformations. So that concludes the first part of the lecture. You should now do exercise one from the QB tutorial GitHub. And when you're finished, uh, you may proceed straight to exercise two, and then we'll resume 